well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the finale, the grand finale of uh, season one of Hocus Focus, episode number 23. I'm Thomas Sheridan. And I'm Sarah Mondaini. And we're going to be taking a break until July 30th. And we're also going to be making a very special announcement at the end of the show. So don't worry, there'll be lots of things in between then to keep you going. We have other projects to work on, both myself and Sarah independently. And we did need a summer break, but we're beginning. The good news is the beginning of season two back on July 30th. So how are you doing, Sarah? I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm looking forward to a bit of a break. And also getting on with our other stuff as well. Um, last week's show response was great, as always. And thanks again for all the comments in the live chat. It was lit up all through the episode. And thanks for everybody joining in with that. And I'm glad that you're enjoying the chance to interact with each other as the show goes out. Um, weather's been up and down. Um, but if it keeps up with the temperatures going up, then from next week, my office will be in the garden and I'm going to be busy working on our other Hocus Focus project as well as writing some stuff for my website. And I'm working on some more videos for the channel. And I'm really, really glad that everybody enjoyed the video I made about the folklore of cats. And if you haven't seen it, it's called Whiskers, Witches and Demons, the Folklore of Cats. So if you haven't seen it, please go and have a watch after you finish watching tonight's episode. And I saw on social media, a lot of people bought that book on cats you recommended about three weeks ago. So it goes to show you cats do rule the world. Well, actually, yes. they rule social media, but Cthulhu is a close second at this point. Well, yes. uh, yeah, it's been really sunny and warm here. Uh, very it's very hot and uh, so I guess it, you'll be getting that weather next so uh, yeah it's looking like a, a quite a good summer ahead of us all weather wise in this part of the world finally our first topic tonight is a topic not unfamiliar to Hocus Focus to either myself and Sarah or the viewers and that's the topic of time slips the concept that people suddenly find themselves in a different time than where they were at the time it happened. We know that Liverpool is very famous for this, and Bold Street and so on. But there's one case that really stands out from 1957, and it took place in the village of Kersey in Suffolk in the far south of England. This uh, story is an interesting one in that it left a very profound emotional effect on the three people who experienced it. It was an autumnal Sunday morning in October 1957 when three Royal Naval cadets were on an orienteering exercise, using their compasses and maps to navigate across the countryside and to find certain spots and locations. Everything went fine, and then they saw a village in the distance, which they knew was Kersey, and decided to make their way towards it. On the way there, they noticed that suddenly all the birds stopped singing, and everything went into a very eerie silence. On top of that, an even stranger phenomenon happened, and the foliage that was on the trees, and it had been, it had been autumn when they were doing their orienta orientation exercise, had turned into a bright summer, vivid green. And even more strange, the church spire was gone as they approached the village. When they entered the village of Kersey, there was no sign of telegraph poles, electrical utility poles, TV antennas, aerials, or any signs of the modern world. The houses looked like they were still in the Middle Ages, they were quite run down and ramshackled, and they looked basically nothing like what the people, the three cadets, experienced or what were expected to experience. Their names were William Lang, who was a Scotsman, Roy, Ray Barker, and Michael Crowley. And they were quite frightened by the experience, even though these were military men. They looked in the window of the only shop in the village, which appeared to be a butcher shop and saw an oxen that had been butchered and skinned and its flesh had been gone bad as if everyone had left the village. 
At this point, they were really freaked out. One suggested knocking on the door to ask where they were. And they all decided in the end, it's probably best that we don't do this. They scurried out of the village and everything went back to normal. But what's remarkable is that these men were affected by this experience for the rest of their lives. They had a profound feeling of depression and sadness while they were walking through the village and the most profound and intense feeling of being stared at, which is quite spooky considering they didn't see anybody. They didn't even see any animals except for some very strange behaving ducks who were not behaving like ducks should behave. And the whole experience took place in a, in a matter of a short while, but it never left them. They entered into a, some kind of time slip portal and came out the other side. It's one of the most interesting time slip stories in that it comes with a strong emotional after effect that these men were very, very affected by. In fact, one of them emigrated to Australia later on. And even years later, when being interviewed about it, said he couldn't get over the sense of sadness yeah. and depression he felt. So that was the Kersey time slip in 1957. What do you think of that, Sarah? I've been thinking about this a lot. And there's a theory called the block universe theory. And I'm going to attempt to try and explain it in layman's terms. But it's where you add a fourth dimension of time to three-dimensional space. And in the theory, the theory goes that our perception of time flowing from the past to the present to the future is an illusion. And, and then the theory kind of questions the understanding of time being linear, where the past is fixed and the present is what we experience now and the future is yet to happen. Um, so according to the block universe theory the past present and future are all equally real and already existing simultaneously so for example if you're walking down the street like these boys were and suddenly everything around you looks like it's from a different time even though you know you're in the present according to the block universe theory your mind might have connected with that specific moment in time Another way of looking at it, to simplify it, is it's like watching a film. So each frame of the film exists all at once on the reel. But when you watch it, you see it one frame after another in a specific order. And so kind of similar in the block universe, all the moments in time, they're already there, but we experience them one after another. So a time slip would be like a temporary glitch where your consciousness briefly jumps to another moment within the block. And it's like seeing or experiencing a different time period overlapping with your present moment. And yeah, it's it's a mind bender. But if the block universe theory is correct, then that could be what happened to the boys. And it's possible that the fabric of space time had a glitch in it and the consciousness slip through now i looked into it a bit further and there could be a glitch in the fabric of space time in that area where the boys were because 60 miles away in ruffham i think you pronounce it there's a red brick georgian mansion that keeps mysteriously appearing and disappearing and it's been doing that since the 1860s and there's been many witnesses who've seen this sudden appearance of a grand red red brick Georgian mansion which would appear and then eventually disappears and it's surrounded by mist and there's been witnesses from 1860 to 2007 reported and they all report feeling this eerie atmosphere on this house's appearance and some investigators believe it's a ghost house and other investigators believe it's the energies trapped in what's called a whirling vortex that's causing it to appear and disappear but after hearing the story of the Kersey time slip and its close proximity to Ruffham, I'm of the mind that it could just be the block universe theory that's right. And there's an anomaly on the space time fabric in that area. Yeah, you explained that very well. I had heard of that before, but I think I'd read it and I had difficulty understanding it. So thanks for clarifying that. 
Yes, that's possible. There's other things too that cross my mind. Uh, the fact that they kept saying that they had this feeling that people were staring at them intensely, uh, that could suggest the fairy stray. Now, the reason why I say that is that they, the town, the village looked dilapidated. And many reports of the fairy world is that their buildings are often dilapidated. And also their animals, they're just not right. There's something not right about their animals. And the only animals they saw were ducks that they said were just not, there was something, not, something very odd about the way the ducks were standing and, and moving about. Now, that's another possibility. There's another, then the aspect of the sense of depression and where was everybody? Where was, where did everybody go? There was one theory I read about that it could have been a huge psychic charge created in the town by the, the death of everybody from the Black Death. And these young men stumbled into uh, the currency in the immediate aftermath of everybody being dead. Hence the rotting meat on the shelf in the uh, butcher shop. And there's one more thing that I would like to throw in there. Were they part of a military experiment? Were the Royal Navy doing something with these three, three young men to see if they could actually do something regarding time travel? That would be the least plausible of the three, but I wouldn't put that off the table either. That they were they had been part, unknowingly been part of some experiment that the Navy had conducted to try and like a kind of a Philadelphia type experiment to try and bend space time. That's interesting. Yeah. Very interesting about the the Navy maybe doing something because the sailors from the Philadelphia experiment were said to be seen disappearing and reappearing again when they were in the pub after they came back to shore. And so another, maybe that not yeah. un, not as unusual as you think it is. No, and another thing is the the descriptions that they gave of the town, the village, I could, in my own mind, could visualize myself there. The way they described it, even though they didn't go into colossal detail, uh, the way the village was described, I could actually, in my mind's eye, actually see it. It was one of those things that I had very good clarity of it. Maybe as if it's some kind of realm that maybe in some other life or in my dream, in my dream world, I've, I've visited maybe the, that moment was your consciousness had traveled to that moment too yeah it was very interesting that uh, now uh, the, the the sense of sadness and depression uh, if that was a time slip as you said the block the quant the quantum block effect what would you think would cause the sadness and depression like just this disor disorientation could be disorientation or it could be that um, if it was the Black Death that had occurred there and that's where they'd slipped, that, that's the moment that they'd slipped into, that they were picking up the, the psychometrical effect of that. Like when you walk into a room and there's been an argument, you know there's been an argument, but you don't have to hear the argument to know that there's something bad to happen. You feel it. Very good so point. It could be that. Could be that, but... When you think about it, it would make sense that if it was time travel, it would be done via consciousness. I mean, think about how many times have you listened to an old record or smelt a certain scent, and it's literally took you back to the place and time that it's reminded you of, um, where you even, even though you know where you are, you're sat on the sofa or wherever you might be physically, but your consciousness is there. And as far as you're concerned, you're there vividly experiencing it again. And then when you come back, you can look at the clock and hours could have passed and the memories are just as fresh as they were the first time you experienced it. And you could swear that you've just relived them again. And it's it's like the strangest feeling. And it doesn't happen every time you reminisce about the past. But when it does happen, you do know about it and you, you maybe can't explain. So we tend to just write it off as one of those things. One of the details in the story that makes it highly plausible for me is that even though when they traveled through time, they ended up in summer, that there was smoke coming out of the chimneys. Now you think to yourself, well, why were they, why were forests lit in the summer? 
Well, that, they did light fires in the summer back in those times because that's how they cooked. That's how they boiled water. The fire was on all the time, even in summer. It was the it was they didn't have gas or electric cookers. So that was a that was one of those details that when I read the story that made it very plausible was the smoke coming out the chimneys. I'm also intrigued by the concept that they wanted to knock on the door but didn't out of fear. That that it's like it's almost like in their own consciousness they were like they didn't want to know what happened to them. Or maybe by setting eyes upon these people, if they were there maybe they would be afraid they'd be trapped in that time zone forever. Yeah. Yeah. Would you have knocked on the door? I'm not sure if no, I would I don't, have. I don't think I would have. Not with the sense of eyes staring at me, because that would imply a sense of danger to immediately leave this place. And that sense of being stared at was probably their own instincts doing that, to say, get out of here now, get back to your normal time. Yeah. I think I'd be more concerned with... I'm a stuck here. How am I going to get back? I just want to get back. I don't want to be here. Yeah. And also, the you know, there's that famous, I think it was a Star Trek episode, where there was people living in a different time frame and they only heard them by like <laughs> whistling by. They travel at a different speed, but they're in a different clock speed of their universe. That might explain why they didn't see any. Yeah. The people were probably in a different clock speed. And it might also explain the strange movements of the ducks. Yes, that episode actually went into the fact that the reason these people were there in the same space, but we, they couldn't see them was because they moved so fast. That time frame or that clock they were in, that reality moved so fast, it became invisible to our to our eyes. Yes. Yeah, I remember that episode, yeah. They heard him through a kind of a whistling effect. Like if he thought, at first he thought it was insects, but it wasn't. It was the other time slip moving at incredible speed around them. You know, this the song by Led Zeppelin, if there's a, a bustle in your is there a rustle in your hedge grow, it's just you know, it's a spring clean for the May Queen. That comes from folklore, the idea that these things are moving in a different space time as well. Well, there you go. Like you said earlier on about that haunted house, that red brick house that appears out of nowhere. Are we dealing with some kind of also a ley line phenomena, an energy path, from an energy grid, the same kind of effect that happens in Bold Street in Liverpool? You know, you know, one of the theories I heard at Bold Street in Liverpool was when they were building the, the railway tunnel under the city, they encountered the, the largest quartz seam that the engineers had ever seen anywhere. Could there be an enormous quartz seam, seam underneath Kersey or that part of Suffolk? Let's, I don't know if anyone's doused the area, or I'm sure they have probably, but if anyone's done an investigation to any of the ley lines that go near it or by there, I mean, we could be dealing with something like that too as well. These energy paths are more likely to create these things. And it, it, it's interesting like it, they, that they are very highly specific. You know, Liverpool and Suffolk, you know, they, they don't happen everywhere. Yes, maybe there's a there is a connection with the energy lines that we don't know about. Yep. I think we talked about that last week um with Loch Ness and So that was the Kersey time slip. If you have any theories on this, if you know of any other places in the world that have time slips, if you think you have a solution to this mystery or would like to add some more to this, let us know because I, I think time slips are something we need to really investigate and and look more at. You know, not just the Liverpool one, the Suffolk ones, but I'm sure they're all over the place. I know there's, there was a famous story of one in Switzerland where people would cross a bridge and find themselves back 100 years earlier. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. Reverend Lionel Fantorp was on Hair and the Hawthorne recently talking about an incredible time slip story about a, a man who went into the basement of a building and came out in a different time. I think it was in Plymouth or no, Ipswich or somewhere. It was in Ipswich, he said. And so there are places, and let, let us know if you know any time slip locations and do you have any theories that might actually allow this phenomena to take place. And this week's folk horror cinema 
is a 1995 science fiction film that was suggested to me by Sarah called Species. It starred Ben Kingsley, Mike and Marsden, who I think is a great actor, and Forrest Whitaker, who's also a great actor. And uh, the film takes place basically around a very interesting concept that they've made contact with an alien world and they'd sent them down a DNA code which they had created in the lab. But unfortunately, this DNA code was this super en entity, this super alien that they had they could they lose they lose control of. It begins with a young girl in a, in a kind of a glass bubble, and Ben Kingsley is overseeing it, and he's he has it filled with gas to kill the young girl. And the fist comes through the glass and she escapes. It turns out she's an alien and she's on the run and she's aging rapidly as well, growing up rapidly, I should say. And Ben Kingsley, who's the leader of this project, recruits a team that includes Mar Michael Marsden, Forrest Whitaker, and a couple of others in order to try and track this person down. They find out that through a train ticket that she had jumped from a freight train somewhere in the American desert and ended up in Los Angeles. They went into Los Angeles to find her. And funny enough, they track her down pretty easily enough. Uh, she's able to be found fairly quickly, uh, but that's not the that's not going to be that easy for them. They're going to have to try and catch her somehow. And anyway, the film basically from that point on is a clever sort of chase. It could be even a cop chase, but they're chasing an alien that shapeshifts between alien and this kind of, you know, gigger type a xenomorph type creature that's running around and there's some brutal murder scenes including a girl having her spinal column ripped out in the toilets of a nightclub and a few other things and it turns out she's trying to mate she try she needs she needs to mate with a human male in order to bring forth this species of aliens in to take over the world and they have to get her before she gives birth eventually it turns out that they chase her into these sort of underground caverns left by the earthquake underneath Los Angeles. And I like this part of the film the best. And one thing leads to another and the predictable happens. A couple of them die and she's actually killed. The alien is killed, but not really because a rat runs off with a piece of the tentacle and the little rat sets up for a future series of films. So it was Sarah suggested the film, and so I'll just give my review of what I thought of it first. It was fun. It was it was a you know it was it was a it was a good action film. It it wasn't stupid or anything like that. It wouldn't be my kind of film. Very American, very shooty uppy. Um, I like Mark and Morrison. I think he's a fantastic actor. And uh, Forrest Whitaker was wasted in this. I thought he was playing a clairvoyant. And to have an, an, an actor of his caliber in it, and even the character he played as this kind of empathic clairvoyant, they they underused him. He wasn't used that well. And there was an English chap who looked like Oscar Wilde, who was kind of almost like a comedy thing. And he meets a gruesome man and a, and a girl who's like supposed to be the bit of tail in the group and this kind of thing. And um, uh, uh, yes, I enjoyed it. Yes, it's very well made. Yes, the acting's very good, particularly Michael Marston, as usual. It's got funny scenes. It's got frightening scenes. It's got quite horrific scenes, including the abduction and murder of a woman by the alien female uh, who blows her to bits by crashing a car full of petrol into a sub electrical substation, which is pretty gruesome. And But it wouldn't be the kind of film I'd see again, to be honest with you. Uh, it's, 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 it's like a Saturday night, pizza and beer have a bit of a laugh but you know unless Sarah can put me straight I didn't it didn't really get me in the way I like films to get me I like a bit of a, a subtext and um, a psychological thing but I haven't said that I can't really fault it I, I you know I can't it, it, it gave you exactly what it says on the tin an alien chase kind of cop movie almost and that was Species uh, what did it, what do you think of my review Sarah and then tell us how you feel about it I thought your review, your review was fine. Yeah, um, you ca you can't like them all. You mean you know something you can't? No, I did like it. I did like it. No, I didn't love it. That's the thing. <laughs> I I was getting me on back for a field in England. 
<laughs> never forgive you for that. No, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Um, well, for me, this film, maybe I'm overthinking it. I don't know, but I'll, I'll let you tell me what you think. But for me, this film brought up a philosophical question in my mind, and that is what happens when the nature of a non-human alien species clashes with that of our own human nature and moral compass. So at the centre of the film is Syl, which is the 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 woman slash alien. She's an alien human hybrid and she was created out of a genetic experiment and she's got um a seductive kind of temptation that she uses to trap these unsuspecting victims. But Still, to me, wasn't inherently evil. She was acting upon her instinctual nature. And the film makes you think about the differences between not only species from other worlds or dimensions, but even different species on our planet. And as humans, we tend to look at other creatures through the lens of our own moral compass, and we try to humanise everything. And still, just like a shark in the ocean functioned according to a very basic primal instinct, which was to survive and procreate. And she didn't have any feelings or empathy or any understanding of the nature of a human being or what it even meant to be human. So her actions were terrifying and unacceptable to us, but her behaviour was dictated by that of her species' genetical makeup and survival needs. And I just thought the film brought up an interesting ethical dilemma, forcing us to look at our own kind of preconceptions. Can we label Syl as truly evil when she's only being true to her own nature? Um, And it makes you question our own place in the universe. And I thought the film was quite clever because in the beginning, it made you feel empathy towards the little girl at the beginning of the film, you felt for her. You wanted them to help her because she was just a helpless little girl born in a lab, no friends, no love, just a laboratory and some toys to play with. And our own human compass could never have imagined the true nature of what this little girl was when she transformed into her true self, which was a predator. Um, and I like the special effects, and you could recognise Giga's work instantly. Um, again, he was creating a place, like we said last week, where beauty and terror are brought together in that special way that only his imagination could create, from the cocoon, the metamorphosis, and then the creature itself. And I thought it was a great sci-fi film that covered instinct and desire and morality, and it just reminded us that creatures even ones as captivating and dangerous as sill they act in accordance with their nature and it just made me think about our moral compass and thinking about the limits of our understanding within a vast universe filled with diverse species no doubt and we shouldn't go messing around with things that we don't know anything about and we shouldn't be using our moral compass as a gauge of what another's nature may be because that's how you get trapped or hurt. You don't try and reason with a shark. You get out of its way and you stay off its radar. And that was what species brought to mind for me. Yes, it's that whole thing, isn't it? The, it only becomes evil when it's above, it's ahead of a certain food chain. And that's the classic Lovecraftian thing, really, the uh, the um, notion that um, it's not personal, uh, that these great entities are these power forces, these alien cosmic gods. It's just business. They're not. They're not. They're not here to hurt us or make us suffer. They're just doing their natural function of the cosmos. So that was the movie Species. We won't have a film, obviously, next week. Uh, because we will have a break, but we'll probably announce it on social media to film before we come back on July 30th. In the meantime, if you have any um, films you'd like to suggest that we cover and uh, let us know. I'm those millions of them out there we still have to hit. And uh, also topics. Don't be afraid to tell us topics you'd like us to cover. 
So that was the last folk horror cinema of season one of Hocus Pocus. In the early 20th century, the world was captivated by the idea of building a ship that would surpass all others in luxury and size, and so the Titanic was conceived. It was a marvel of engineering and opulence, a floating palace on the sea. And one fateful day in 1912, the Titanic set sail from Southampton, England, on its maiden voyage across the Atlantic, and the ship was a symbol of grandeur carrying both the wealthy and the hopeful, seeking a new life in America. It was full of dreams and caviar, and as it ventured into the vast ocean, excitement and anticipation must have filled the air. But tragedy struck on the night of the 14th of April, when the Titanic collided with an iceberg. The ship's destiny was sealed and chaos ensued. Passengers and crew found themselves desperately trying to escape the sinking vessel, The heroic acts of some and the devastating loss of others would be forever etched in history. The world watched in shock and grief as news of the Titanic's demise spread. Inquiries and investigations tried to unravel the series of events that led to this catastrophic event. The sinking of the Titanic sparked significant changes in maritime regulations, aiming to prevent such a tragedy from ever occurring again. Yet the Titanic's legacy extends beyond its fateful its fateful end. It lives on in the collective memory forever, reminding us of the resilience of the human spirit and the frailty of our aspirations. In the decades that followed, the Titanic story captured the imaginations of writers, filmmakers and artists. Books were written, movies were made and documentaries were produced, all seeking to preserve the memory of this monumental ship and the lives it carried. The 14th of April, 1912. A night to remember. A night when the largest, most luxurious liner of her day was speeding across the North Atlantic on her maiden voyage. No expense had been spared to make this ship a symbol of man's final victory over nature. Her first-class passengers were the very cream of society, the aristocrats from Europe and millionaires homeward bound to America. In the steerage class, everyone enjoyed their own kind of boisterous fun. Then there were the second-class passengers and the crew. 2,208 happy, confident people speeding across a flat, calm sea in a ship that everyone knew was unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable. The ship was called the Titanic. What did you see? Iceberg, get ahead, sir! Kenneth Moore, whose warm, compelling sincerity holds him high in the hearts of cinema goers all over the world as Lightoller, the second officer on a ship whose destruction shook the very foundation of man's progress and marked the end of an era. How many people are there on board? 2,200 or more. And room in the boats for... How many? 1,200. This is the epic drama of the greatest disaster in the history of the sea. Goodbye, my dear son. No! 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 Here, for the first time, is the story of that night. A night when 2,200 men, women and children were faced with a terrible fact the fact that most of them were going to die. 
No work of fiction could ever contain such incredible twists of fate or leave such terrible questions unanswered to haunt the mind. Why did that last ice warning never reach the captain? What happened on the ship that stopped within sight of this struggle with death, but didn't save a single life? No writer of thrillers could ever achieve such agonizing suspense. Sir, sir, what the devil's going? Haven't you learned to knock before you come in here? It's a distress call, sir, from the Titanic. She's sinking. Carpathia, sir. She's making 17 knots and should be with us about 3.30. That'll be too late. Now, let's turn our hocus focus to the supernatural mystique that surrounds the Titanic. Beyond the historical accounts and the tragic events lies a somewhat fortian and hauntological narrative of eerie stories and unexplained phenomena. Why is it still so ingrained within our psyche over a hundred years later? Well, the Titanic, with all its grandeur and technological wonders of its time, symbolised the height of human achievement and progress. It was a romanticised version of the past that brings up feelings of nostalgia for a time that was seen as simpler or more glamorous. A place of escapism, and it represented a world that appeared safe, secure and prosperous, untouchable even which showed the optimism and self-assurance of that early 20th century. The ship was considered unsinkable, conveying the confidence of a time marked by both industrial and scientific breakthroughs and an ever-expanding global economy. But then the sinking of the Titanic shattered all that illusion. It showed that even the most secure and advanced creations could be vulnerable and subject to disaster, and even the most top-class societies and the world's most wealthiest people are vulnerable to unexpected disruptions. And so our assumptions of safety and permanence can be shattered. The sinking could be seen as a metaphor for the limitations of human knowledge, showing us how fragile life is, no matter how self-assured or wealthy a person is. Nothing is certain. The Titanic is also a reminder of a world that at the time was on the brink of big changes. In 1914, the outbreak of World War I came, which led to the collapse of empires and immense losses of life and a shift in global powers. And the sinking of the Titanic occurring just two years before this major global upheaval may have foreshadowed the impending transformation and marked the end of an era. Perhaps it signified the start of a new wave function and the end of an old one, as the illusion of invincibility and overconfidence collapsed. Another reason I believe it continues to resonate in the present is through past life memories related to the Titanic, because some people claim to have memories or visions of being on the ship or having a connection to the disaster in a previous life, which suggests that the events of the Titanic sinking continued to resonate in the present through past life experiences. And for those who believe they have past life connections to it, acknowledging those memories can be a healing process. But perhaps one of the biggest reasons why it's still so prominent in the present is due to its connections to the collective consciousness. That the Titanic sinking has left an imprint upon creative consciousness, creating a strong emotional response, not only from those directly affected, but also from people across the world who followed the news and felt a deep sense of empathy. This emotional resonance has contributed to the lasting impact of the event upon the collective consciousness. The stories of heroism, sacrifice and loss associated with the, ta with the Titanic 
as evoked to universal emotions, creating a sense of shared humanity. Psychic connections and premonitions add yet another layer to the story. Some individuals claim to have vivid memories, visions or strong emotional ties to the Titanic, connecting them to a past life on board the doomed vessel. There's also rumours of a curse, suggesting that the Titanic was doomed from the start, perhaps bearing the weight of some kind of cosmic hex. There's lots more things to discuss on tonight's journey into the supernatural mystique of the Titanic, where those echoes from the past are still calling us in the present. That was a lovely intro, Sarah. What strikes me about the Titanic story is the endurance of it how it still is so popular. You go, you type Titanic into the internet and if there's endless numbers of videos dealing with it, with colossal numbers of views, uh, people are absolutely fascinated with this. And we're alone before the James Cameron movie of 20 odd years ago, whenever that came out. You, start, you spoke about the curse. See, the Titanic's a good one for Hocus Pocus because it's got a hauntological, a supernatural, and a kind of a consciousness, uh, and even a conspiratorial element to it. Regarding the curse, there was an urban legend that we grew up in Ireland that the serial, it's not true, it's totally false. Well, this, the curse part is, it was built at Harlan Wolf shipyard in Belfast, and Catholics could not get jobs there. It was built, you know, it was, it, it was built by unionists and in Northern Ireland at that time in a very sectarian culture and Catholics were second class citizens. So if they got jobs in a place like that, they were basically the, the lowest of the low, the most dangerous jobs. Now, there was a room, a urban legend that we grew up in in Ireland that the, the, a curse had been put on the Titanic because its serial number was e, E9-09-O-N which was no Pope spelled backwards. It's completely false. But when we were kids and aren't told this, you, you, would, you hadn't got the means to check it. You go, wow, that's amazing. You know, like it, that kind of thing. So you believe that it was the curse of the witch. Now, my first introduction to the Titanic story was the British movie made in the 1940s called The Night to Remember. It absolutely terrified me. It is still the best Titanic movie. It is literally gothic in its style. It's like a gothic horror film about the sinking of the ship. And it, it, it doesn't go into the full detail. There was, you see, it, so much about life was covered in that sinking. They didn't let the third class passengers on to the deck to the lifeboats after they'd made sure that everyone else had, the rich had all got a chance to get on a lifeboat before them. So there was like, there were basically the, the poor people down in third class were sacrificed uh, for the rich, men, women, and children. Uh, the, the lifeboats were grossly, there was more than enough lifeboats for everyone, but they were badly launched, quickly launched, and left with a handful of people in some of them. So there was no, uh, there was no lifeboats to go to when most of the passengers were on the deck. And also, they were looking out at lifeboats surrounding the Titanic that were completely that were completely half empty. You know, this was caused, you know, obviously, you know, fear, annoyance and anger, you know, in tandem with the terror. Now the ship, I always think this is so many things I always remember. But I read the book, A Night to Remember, which is a fantastic account of the, of the sinking. The Titanic went down on a sea that was as flat as glass in the middle of the North Atlantic. It was completely still, not a cloud in the sky, starlit night. It was a beautiful, perfect night. You know, so there was no danger with capsizing lifeboats or anything. It was a very slow thing. But one of the things I always remember is that the ones who did as they were told and behaved orderly and said, we'll wait our turn or stand in queue as, as the stewards told them, went down with the ship where the ones who said the hell with that and made their way to the lifeboats or, or jumped into them were the ones who survived. 
And that always reminds me of the needlecraft, you know, the same kind of dynamic, the same thing. You know, if you, you're doomed if you follow the protocol in a, in a situation like that. And if you if you didn't, if you reject the protocol and take things into your own hands, ultimately you have a better chance of survival. The the thing I always remember in the book and didn't do it well in the in the film, but it's done so in some good documentaries, is that when the ship turned upright like this, it was like way up in the air most of, the, and the people were on this side, and then it suddenly went down to the water. And there was the scream of a thousand people or so as they plunged into the depths. And then the people said they heard absolute silence. And that was the most the thing that everyone who survived it always recalled was the sudden silence in a beautiful calm sea under a starry sky. There was suddenly pandemonium and switched of like the people went through a stargate or something there was that kind of a, a, a gigantic stepping into consciousness and it affected people so deeply that and then they bought then the, the water surrounded with dead bodies and yet uh, quite a few people were pulled out of water like 50 or so you know you 10 minutes and you're dead but um, quite a few got out surprisingly those uh, quite a few lied they jumped into the lifeboats and said they jumped into the water but they didn't they were in the lifeboats they were exposed as frauds later now, one of the interesting things is that when the first telegraphs, when the Carpathians started picking up the passengers, they said, where are they? Where's the Titanic? And they said, they're gone. But they said that they'd saved everybody. So somebody involved in the Titanic crew had told the Carpathian that everyone had been put into lifeboats. Everyone was saved. And they'd messaged back to New York that there was all lives had been saved. And as newspapers were printed, that morning in New York says no one died on the Titanic or most people were saved. And that was a, that was a very strange thing. There was also a conspiracy, which I actually don't believe because I've, I've, I've looked into it, that it's sister ship that was built in the same dock, the Olympic. There was actually problems with it and they switched the two ships names. And as an insurance scam, they sunk one to the bottom of the sea. There was a coal fire. And this, this was another thing I, I read, but again, it, it, it's not true. You want to look into it. It's, it's it's very speculative. There was another thing too that it was used to assassinate certain high profile figures. Well, when you look at it in reality, very few toffs or rich people went down. They were all on the lifeboats. It was mostly the poor that went down. And even even the James Cameron movie tried to make out that there was this noble deaths of the wealthy. It, it did it, it it did happen, but it wasn't the norm. Uh, the, the other hand, the Lusitania does suggest that that was a hit. That was an actual hit on certain people inside the Lusitania. Now, that whole, the whole thing that always stuck with me was that moment of silence and this whole thing of like the people in the boats, the still of the, the ocean, the ship gone, the horror that has passed, the stars in the sky, you know, the whole thing of like the, the Stella Maris, the star of the sea. This is a mystery. A mystical concept in Christianity that has developed since the Middle Ages, generally associated with the Virgin Mary, the whole Stella, Stella Maris thing, that the actual sea represents the, the reflection of the stars in the sea represents the, the kingdom of heaven brought down to earth. Now, that's exactly what happened that night when you think about it. When they plunged into the star, the, 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 the flat star filled water, they literally went through a stargate into heaven, which was being reflected above. Interesting, Stella Maris is believed that cult is <clears throat> believed to be based on ISIS, uh, a, a leftover of the ISIS cult from the Middle East. But I think uh, uh, the, there's something more to the Titanic we're not being told about. Now, I know there's conspiracies and all this kind of thing, but of all the ships that have ever sunk, and there's been other ones on their maiden voyage and bigger ones and all this kind of greater losses of life, that one endures in our consciousness because we're being told something here. We're being given a message somehow. It's almost like you have to remember this. It won't go away, that kind of thing. And um, as you said, it was like a portal onto the world. It was like a wave function collapse onto the world to come. So, yeah, a stargate, wave function collapse. There's so much more to the Titanic than merely 
a romantic, you know, I'm going to use that word, a romantic sea disaster. And finally, there's that famous novel, Futility, that was written about a decade before that predicted a ship about the same size as the Titanic called the Titan that hit an iceberg in approximately the same location with about the same loss of life. So there was that predictive quality as well. So the fact that the book predicted it and the effect that we've had upon us afterwards tells us that there's more to that story. Maybe there is a course, maybe there was a course than meets the eye. Well, there were a lot of stories told of passengers who were booked on the Titanic who cancelled because of bad omens or otherwise um, they saw they foresaw the disaster. And one of the examples was a, um, a premonitionary dream, which a man called J. Conan Middleton, sorry, J. Conan Middleton had had. Um, and he said that he'd had the dream on two consecutive nights. Um, and this account was taken from something called the SPR's Journal of June, June 1912. And Middleton cancelled his booking as a direct result of those dreams. But he gave the official reason to the travel agency as being because he'd received uh, an urgent telegram from America suggesting that he postpone sailing for a few days and come on another ship. There was a, a famous Irish photographer who's actually a priest called Father Michael Brown. He's very famous here in Ireland as a as a sort of like a social photographer of the nineteen, you know, from the nineteen tens on to the nineteen forties. His photographs are very famous, and um, he was the last person to photograph the Titanic when it was in Queenstown, which is now called Cove, in County Cork. And he was offered a, he made friends with a, a wealthy American who was interested in photography too. And they, they had a great conversation about photography. And the American said, I'll tell you what, hop on the hop on the ship and I'll give you a free passage to New York and you can do a photo document, a photo journal of the journey. And uh, he called this bishop back and said, I've been offered a free trip to New York and the Titanic, can I go? And the bishop said, no, I need you for something else. So that was like almost like a real, real, real divine intervention then. But he took the last of a photograph of Titanic sailing in, out of Cork Harbour into the Atlantic, which is kind of profound in itself because he was meant to be on that ship. And there was huge numbers of children died on it, which was horrible. It's another thing, too. And uh, the, the band, the, the, in the book, The Night to Remember, the story, the, this lot of detail goes into about the band. Those men played the music as if they knew they were doomed from the first note they struck up it was they said it was very strange not one of them panicked not one of them left their station they sit there playing music and they right as the, sh the, the front part of the ship broke off and the back kicked up they were playing nearer my god today and they never ran or every la every single one of them died it's almost like they were aware that their job now was to help usher people through the with the help of music in through the Stargate, through the Stella Maris portal into the other side. I, this is incredibly moving when you read about that in the book. In the film, A Night to Remember, and it was an awful scene, there's a scene where a little boy is running around the deck going, I, 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 I can't find my mummy, where's my mummy? And an old like English gentleman picks him up and holds him, we'll find your mummy. And he goes to the back of the ship and as the wave is coming in to swallow them, the old man goes to the little boy, your mummy's coming right now. Oh, it's awful. It's just like, what, your mummy? You know, like the whole thing of your mother's coming now. The, the, you know, like when men are dying on the battlefield, they also they often call her mother. The, the sort of, that, that again, the, the, the holy mother, the mother, you know, the Virgin Mary, the Stella Maris, Isis, the, the transport through the portal. It's, it's incredibly moving stuff, even now talking about it. Like, I'm, I'm, I mean, no, I'm getting a lump in my throat. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, you know, it's, it instantaneously entered into our mythology. You know, it was that story, it was one of the, it, it didn't, it didn't vanish and then come, become popular again. It instantaneously became part of Western mythology. And that, that happens for a reason. There's a, 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 a recent book, well, certainly in the last 10 years, and it's called Transcending the Titanic Beyond Death's Door by a man called Michael Tim. 
And um, in that book, he writes that there was a passenger on board called W.T. Stead, who was a British um, journalist, I think, and also a spiritualist and a friend of um, Arthur Conan Doyle. And uh, this W.T. Stead, he he was psychic as well. Um, and he apparently, he died, well, he died in the, um, in the disaster, but he's appeared at seances after the sinking. He's actually turned up at seances, as did a man called John Jacob Astor the Fourth, who was the richest man on board. And there are accounts of um, these seances where the people who've come through are giving details of what it was like to pass over when the ship sank and how the victims' different life experiences affected the manner in which they reacted to their changed circumstances. So... Stead's post-mortem appearances suggest that because he had studied the evidence provided to him by spiritualism all his life, he was able to move on more easily than some of the others on the ship, with the wealthy people finding that earthly attachment to possessions kind of um, caused problems during the transition because they didn't want to go. And an Irish astrologer called Count Louis Hammond, also known as Chiro, he warned this man, W.T. Stead, against travelling on the Titanic. And he said, he said, I see more than a thousand people. You are among them and you're struggling desperately in the water um, and they're screaming for help and fighting for their lives. But it does none of them any good yourself included so you mustn't get on the boat but um he didn't listen and he got on and he died about aster that's one of the tell what the conspiracy theory started off about the it was a hit, a hit on the rich he um maybe the federal bank wasn't it yeah someone seen his body floating in the water and said that he had severe he, he obviously had severe head trauma He'd either been shot or he'd been beaten up with something. But, you know, that's a hard one to say because when that ship was going down, every lots of heavy metal pieces fell off and furniture and everything. If something could have landed on his body while he was in the water or something or could have. But, you know, surprising he didn't get in the boat. He was one of the richest men in the world. So there's there's always been that. That, that would be the one that if there was a conspiracy theory around like it being a hit, that would be the one. But the, the the rest of the toffs all got off. I mean, they you know, it, it, it was that was hidden for decades. That like you know that the the third class passengers who were mostly immigrants from all over the world, not just Ireland, but from from everywhere, from poor European immigrants, they opened the gate, they locked them behind the gates, and then they let them on board, and all the lifeboats were gone. I mean, that just goes to show you what the class system was like, and it was also a, a forerunner of World War One, which was to come, which was mostly going to kill the working class of Europe anyway. Just going back to the, the, the man I was talking about before, W.T. Stead, William Thomas Stead. Um, I mentioned before he was psychic. Well, he'd seen, um, he'd foreseen his own death on the Titanic. And a few decades before the um, event happened, he wrote, he actually wrote two fictional stories about sinking ships. And the first was called How the Mail Steamer Went Down in Mid-Atlantic by a survivor, written in 1886, and tells the story of a mail steamer's collision with another ship resulting in high loss of life due to lack of lifeboats. And the second story that he wrote was called From the Old World to the New, which features a white star-line vessel called the Majestic that rescues survivors of another ship that had collided with an iceberg. And in the story, it's captained by a man named Edward J. Smith. And that name really did captain the Majestic. Wow. But after its publication, um, and then even more strangely, was the captain of the Titanic. That was the captain of the Titanic's name. Smith, yeah. So the, the, the synchronicities or, or the um, premonitions or whatever is a better word, they just, they just keep coming. And coming yeah yeah okay. so uh, uh, and that trip from liverpool to i think it was liverpool to southampton southampton to cherbourg 
Cherbourg to Cove or Queenstown, and then off. That was almost like it's a farewell tour or something. It was very peculiar, you know. Um, the it, but even in the James Cameron film, I've never seen it, but I've seen the end of it when it was on TV. The the girl who's the old lady then when she dies, she goes back as a ghost to meet uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character in the ship as it was the night before it sunk. And um, so even they could even in that version of the film they couldn't avoid the kind of supernaturalism. Yeah, how about this for a strange tale? And um, this is from the our favorite book here, which I just randomly found this uh, quite luckily. It's called just a little section. It's called an iceberg in the sky, and it says in July 1975, a large block of ice fell through the roof of a home in Dunstable. Bedford, England. At the time of the incident, the family were engrossed in a TV movie about the Titanic. As the ice cra- as the ice, excuse me, as the ice crashed through their ceiling, they were tensely waiting for the ship to strike the fateful iceberg. Wow, it was almost like they generated it or something through extreme concentration. Wow, wow. And then, then the iceberg thing itself, you think of the iceberg, what a metaphor for the subconscious mind. You have like a tiny piece above the water, which is like the conscious mind, and then the huge subconscious daemon part down below the water, you know, which is invisible because it's full of water. Where you see the top part, it's white because it, it reacts with air and sunlight, but the bottom part is invisible because it's saturated with water. So that's like even the, an iceberg is a metaphor by itself, you know. Just I mentioned earlier about a lot of people cancel the tickets. They didn't want to get on it because they had a bad a bad feeling or they'd had dreams and things like that. Well, there was a survey done or an ex, um, an investigation done in the 1950s, nothing to do with um, sinking ships, but it was to do with the trains in England and about how on the days that trains crashed, they were not even a quarter full as they would be on the days that they didn't crash. And it was almost like people knew, they knew and they, and they can unexplainably cancelled. So every day that a trip, because trains don't crash, they don't crash very often. So it was easy to kind of see a correlation. And on the days when the accidents had happened, the trains were less than half empty. Yet the day after, or on days when there wasn't an accident about to occur, they were full to capacity. I have heard that story before. It's very interesting. And either some things would happen, like the taxi they were taken to the train station broke down, or the taxi driver went the wrong way and got lost, and they missed their train by a minute or two. Very, very interesting. You, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of them with the Titanic. Sorry. That happened with a lot of people um, before they got on the um, the aeroplane. On September the 11th, there was lots of stories of people who were alarm clocks didn't go off or they were running late or the car wouldn't start, all kinds of things, or they just felt the urge to go and stop for a donut or they got to the gas station and the man in the gas station kept them talking and they couldn't get away. It brings us right back to the first story about time not being literal and not being linear, that you can somehow see the future if it has a trauma connected to it. Yeah. So that was the mystique of the Titanic. Uh, that I, I think that was a very powerful segment. I really felt very emotional talking through it. And I'm not one of these Titanic type. I've never gone to the, the dock in Belfast. I'm not one of those type. I just find the, this, the mystique of it very strange. So if you have anything more to add to this, your own th- to theories, if you have your own feelings about it, any other stories or conspiracy theories we haven't heard about, you know, the comments are down below. And um, I do suggest highly, if you haven't seen it, watch the British movie from the 1940s called The Night to Remember. It's, it's, and, and you want to read the book, the book is fantastic as well. And uh, that w- I think that gives the most um, sobering word, I would use the most sobering uh, telling of the story. So that was the mystique of the Titanic. And now for the final time, of this season of Hocus Focus. Here's Sarah and a psychic hygiene that hopefully will serve you well over the summer months. I 
As you spend time outdoors in the sun this summer, think about the sun's symbolic significance and think about its role in nurturing your psychic well-being. Here are some suggestions to consider while you sit in the sun this summer. The sun has long been revered as a symbol of illumination and enlightenment. And just as the sun illuminates the world, it also shines a light on our inner selves. Its presence inspires us to seek truth, clarity and self-awareness, guiding us towards a deeper understanding of our own psyche. It also represents an endless source of life-giving energy. Its warmth and radiance infuse us with vitality. How much better do we feel on a sunny day? It can give us a renewed sense of purpose. By connecting with the sun's energy, we tap into a cosmic flow that replenishes our energy reserves. The sun's cycle of rising and setting mirrors the ebb and flow of our life's journey. Just as the sun rises anew each day, sunlight triggers the release of serotonin, a neurotransmitter that uplifts mood and promotes a sense of well-being. It can help combat feelings of anxiety, stress and depression, allowing you to experience greater mental clarity and emotional balance. The sun's daily journey across the sky reflects the cyclical nature of existence and reminds us of the ever-changing rhythms of life, encouraging us to embrace the brief nature of experiences. By aligning ourselves with the sun cycles, we gain a deeper appreciation for the ebb and flow of our life finding solace in the knowledge that change is an inherent part of our journey. So, as you immerse yourself in the sun's warm embrace this summer, sit quietly and ponder the aspects it represents. Reflect on its symbolic significance, its role as a source of energy and transformation, and its reminder of our interconnectedness with the universe. By thinking about these aspects, you can invite its radiant influences to illuminate your own path of self-discovery. And that's my psychic hygiene suggestion for this summer. And a very useful and appropriate one it is. Thank you, Sarah. So what's next? And our final topic of the night, and the third and final topic of this season of Hocus Focus, we thought it'd be appropriate if we spoke about the concept of prophecy. Now, as both of us are pagans, we very much believe in the concept that the universe operates in a series of cycles, that things come back and new cycles begin again, just like they do with the seasons. Here on Earth, there are seasons and times and cycles and cyclical events that happen within the greater cosmos. And they're very heavily connected to human consciousness. In fact, in many ways, they are a manifestation of human consciousness. Uh, we know these as things like the Kali Yuga or the Yuga's cycle of the Vedic Hindu world. We know about Ragnarok and we know about uh, the Babes prophecy in the ancient art of mythology. And we're gonna talk about this tonight, but I'm gonna concentrate on the intro on the Kali Yuga. Now, Everyone's heard of the Kali Yuga. It is the fourth and most negative part of the Yuga cycle. It represents the degradation of mankind in three parts, where you have the beginning of the degradation, you have the peak, and then the waning of it, but the waning of it actually gets much worse. It's been compared to uh, the shift from the soul into the frontal cortex of the brain. This part of the brain that's obsessed with taking care of yourself, selfishness, and moves you away from spirituality, that you've turned your back on the spirit. This has happened because at the end of the previous cycle, the Dhafapana cycle, Krishna has been killed. And we're all alone. It's almost like we are left with our own moral or ethical compass to guide us. But because the lack of spirituality is present in mankind and the cycle of dharma has also been forgotten that the base and uh, destructive and ho horrible behavior by humans happens at the end of the cycle 
now, in traditional Hinduism, Vedas, the Vedic religions, these cycles, the end of the Kali Yuga, is predicted to be thousands of years into the future, many thousands of years. However, there's also a school of thought within some yogis and gurus in India that's actually taking off that these cycles are reflections of shifts in consciousness. And because of things like advances in technology, such as the internet, these yugas are ending much more quickly. Now, about 15 years ago, I wrote an article on the rise in paganism within Europe and in Western consciousness was probably a result of Crowley's Aeon of Horus prematurely being ended by the internet. So it was a quite a synchronistic surprise to me that here we have yogis in India also saying the same thing, that human consciousness has been rapidly speeded forward. We don't live in an agrarian society anymore as when the yugas were originally devised. 10,000 years ago, we live in a very different world where time and speed and energy flows much more quickly. There are several yogis and several gurus in India now who believe that the end of the Kali Yuga is 2025, 2026. And we are at the very base part of the end where degradation breaks down. You only have to look at the world around you. You only have to look at the the so-called woke things that go on, that the, the beastly and ghastly behaviors that pass for human freedom and human free choice. And basically the assault upon children has now reached a new horrific end with the, the desire to butcher them in the name of some woke ideology that's rapidly fading. Now this ties in perfectly with the end of the Kali Yuga. Now the Kali Yuga is not about the goddess Kali that many people seem to think it is. It's about the demon Kali, a very different entity altogether. And his destruction at the end of the Kali Yuga uh, brings back Dharma and moves us into the next uh, the next uh, Satya cycle, of the, of the next Satya Yuga cycle. So I'm intending to believe now that we are in the final years of the Kali Yuga. I do agree with the concept that Technology and particularly the internet and things like AI would play a part in this. That human consciousness has been brought up to speed in a much faster way than was expected. Now, 2025, 26 is where also I've heard other people who use predictive software and so on said there will be a crisis point where something happens in humanity. You cannot detract the Kali Yuga from the Babes prophecy which was made by the Morrigan or the Morrigana, the Bay of Crow Goddess at the Second Battle of Maitura, where she spoke about the same things that are mentioned in the Kali Yuga. Not surprising, uh, they are from the same Indo-European origin. Uh, she spoke about it would be a wicked time where there would be fields without harvest. Look what they're doing in, in Holland and agriculture everywhere. Seas without produce. Um, uh, men would not seek a lover outside of their home. Uh, women would go to bed with their sons. There would be incest. There would be all kinds of horrors. Every man a usurper. An evil, wicked time. Well, that seems to tie in very nicely, unfortunately, with the end of the Kali Yuga. And of course, you're all familiar with the Ragnarok and that cycle, that the end of the the the, God, the old gods, uh, the end of the Aesir gods, they they basically end in a cataclysmic battle uh, on a plane. And it, it's it's very similar, but it's shown in sort of like cycles, like you have the uh, the Midgard Serpent fighting Thor that could be seen almost like as a kind of a, a chakra kind of thing, uh, using the spinal column, whatever, uh, the nervous system. But uh, it's shown in a different heroic way. And of course, this was written down by Christians, so we don't know the full story. Uh, to me, I really believe we are in the end of it all. I feel we're in the end of the Aeon of Horus prematurely. We're in the end of the Kali Yuga. The base prop is, is coming into manifestation, and we're at Ragnarok. I think the, there's no, you know, you, you tend to look at these things in your own time and say, well, 
you know, I see it through my lenses. But my God, there's been no period in history like what's happening now. There's been no uh, conflict or paradoxical schizophrenic dichotomy within the nature of man. It's it's completely disruptive. It's distorted. It's fractured. And it's uh, it's ready for renewal. And I feel it more and more every day. I do now believe that we should look to 25, 26. I don't know why I do other than the the yugas, then the, the redating of the yugas suggest, suggest this. Uh, but it feels right. It feels right to me. It feels like we're ready for a, a, re, a rejuvenation. Uh, I would You can see so many things have changed and just even since 2020 for the obvious reason and what happened there. But that one almost seemed to be the galloping horse at the end of the yuga. That seemed to be the the, the final push, the moment when the uh, the plane of big would sunk below the the ocean and the Aesir gods went down with it. The the moment when when Lulan Fada uh, slaughtered uh, Balor of the Evil Eye on the Battle of in my Torah. I, I, I can feel very strongly we're here and it's probably an ideal subject for the last hocus focus of the season. Mm-hmm. There we go. There we have it. Uh, the Kali Yuga is not hundreds of thousands of years in the future or tens of thousands of years in the future. It's now we're in it. And uh, how do you feel, Sarah? Um, well, at first, I, I, not a nice thing to to contemplate or to think about, really. But as three years of as we've gone further into the last three years and where we are now, then I think it's been a long time coming and if it's going to do a bit of cleaning up and sorting out and and restoring the balance on earth then i'm all for it and the vedic scriptures recommend meditation and yoga and various other spiritual practices as a natural antidote to the strife of the kali yuga so i think i think it's important that we don't fall into thinking that we're all doomed And there's nothing we can do about it. Um, And we don't start feeling hopeless. But instead, we just strengthen our personal practice and act as a light in the dark times for those around us that are lost and to try and find some peace. Um, Because to find peace in peaceful times is not really an accomplishment, but to find peace in the most unpeaceful times is what the Vedics consider true spiritual attainment. So, yeah, according to the prophecy, the Kali Yuga is recognized by what you like, what you said, the moral degradation of social turmoil, a loss of spiritual values, increased greed, selfishness, materialism. Um, everybody's driven by the lower instincts rather than the higher values and the consequences of all this spiritual design uh, decline just manifests in the form of widespread conflicts, which we're seeing, um, environmental issues, which we're seeing, social injustice, and just an overall discontentment. And in modern times, there's no denying that you can see the Kali Yuga's characteristics in the state of the world. Conflicts everywhere, fueled by greed and power and consumerism and crisis is here and there and just a severe disconnection from source and a lack of awareness of our own um, human consciousness and I think that that in itself creates all these self-destructive cycles so if we're at the end of it that makes me feel better oh I'm not bothered by it at all we have to remember and people listen to this that you cannot take this information in with with Abrahamic consciousness. It's not the end of the world, like we're all going to be destroyed, like in Revelations, and, you know, we're going to go to heaven. That's not the the pagan way. That's that's the Abrahamic way. So don't think of it in terms of that way. The reason why the satyrs came came up with Ragnarok and the the Druids or whatever came up with the the Bayes prophecy, uh, whoever the previous shamanic culture before that, and the Vedics came up with the the yugas is to prepare us. We're being pre- to prepare ourselves. Now, I think the fact that we've gone through the last three years from the needlecraft on 
of the, the whole nonsense and all that and survive this far with our principles intact. And even if you've been you were duped by that and now see through it, you have the the life raft to bring in the Titanic thing to get you through to the next part, the next cycle. I really do believe this. Now, the cycle doesn't mean it's going to be you wake up one the morning in 2026 and bang, it's gone. It just means an improvement will happen then. And there's already glimmers of improvement at the moment. I can't really talk about it on here because I'm getting the trouble with YouTube. But you, there already are improvements. There already are things happening. And the dark nature of certain individuals and certain practices has come, you know, has come to light. And even in the Hebrew text, even in the, the early Christian text, they talk about people who are left behind on Judgment Day. Well, that's us. We're going to be left behind on Judgment Day. You know, in, in that sense, we will be the ones who will carry on and then recon reconfigure and reconsider and reincorporate Dharma as a collective idea back into us. Uh, we're already in a state of Dharma. We're trying at the best we can. At the moment, we're all things considered, but we're already preparing ourselves for when the the restoration of Dharma proper on the collective scale appears in a couple of years. So don't be thinking that this is a deadly or doom thing or it's going to be all human suffering and all this stuff. You have been given the toolkit to get through by being aware of prophecy. Pagan prophecy is not about doom. Pagan prophecy is like prepping for the soul, the mind, and the consciousness. And that's how you see this stuff. You don't see it as something to be fearful of. You see it as a challenge. And there's no evolution without, you know, coming to terms of challenges. It's also, it's a period that we have to go through. Um, the, because the material world is a place of duality and everything must have an opposite, like good and bad and light and dark, birth and death. And the Kali Yuga is the age of conflict and strife and chaos. But then the darkness of this age makes the luminous path of the coming age even shine even brighter. So we have to go through this age of darkness because without it, you can't have the light. Yep. So you, you've got to go through it. You've got to um, weather the storm and... Um, be brave like we have been for the last three years and keep seeing through the the lies and um just know that you're not going through it alone and we'll come out the other side. Yeah and Sam and Frodo they're they're right now they're climbing the the steps of they're crossing Mordor. You know that's where we are. And you know there's a, Fra a Sam and Frodo in all of us but there's also an Aragorn and uh, everyone else in the Gandalf. And we're waiting, you know, we're waiting for that to happen. And, uh, you know, the Mount Doom will fall. It will happen. And it will restore itself. I mean, the concept of the rings within the, in that, where the rings were representing cycles. They were representing cycles. So uh, don't be afraid of this. It's, it's, it's actually, if anything, you can actually put yourself in a position where you become a spectator of it and an observer of it. And it'll have all phenomenal potentials for creativity, growth, and developing a better understanding of yourself. I've mentioned there on social on Facebook the other night that all these debunkers have all vanished. Prior to 2020, the internet was a sea of people who seemed to just debunk anything to do that wasn't scientific. Where are they all gone? Well, I think you know where they're gone. Mother Hydra's babies have harvested many of them. And other ones have actually probably had a a consciousness awaking and realizing they were full of shit all along. And maybe there is a greater dynamic to reality. But literally, I'm hearing stories of skeptics channels that literally stopped uploading in late 2022, out of the blue. Or where videos once a week, then it goes gone. Not, and they've never been on since. So this is the, this again is part of the end of this yuga. And uh, there's, uh, there's, we're, they're already clearing the way out for a spiritual revival rather than the scientific one and this is what the great reset i often think is sometime about it's the, the demon kali as possessive of the world economic forum trying to prevent the yuga from ending 
So think about that one. And if you're against all this stuff, well, what does that make you? It makes you a hero. And so I'll think of it in that terms. I do. What what interests me and is what is going to happen to the souls of those people we're not allowed to mention on the channel. I know it's none of our business what their karma is and what happens to their souls, but I just can't help but think about what is going to be the consequence of that when it comes to reincarnation time. I don't want to talk about it too much because I don't want to hurt people's feelings who might have, you know, been transubstantiated by the needlecraft. But, you know, and I'm not also going to sit there, sit here and be Mr. You know, condemning of someone's soul, because I don't know for certain, but yet it is very apparent and within the tripartite uh, aspect of your new European reincarnation that you don't mess with your essence, your ancestral soul. And what is that? That is your DNA. And this is probably one of the reasons why the needlecraft was much less used in India and Hindus prefer to go down, go down the horse tranquilizer route or whatever it was, the horse medicine route. So that suggests that they're in India, they were aware of this. Is it, are, are people doomed? I don't know. I'm not going to say that. Uh, well, this is probably where karma comes in. This is where you've got to work on the spiritual aspects of yourself. This is where you've got to cleanse yourself. I, I, I do believe we know through epigenetics that you can actually change your DNA. That's That's been proven. That's a fact. I covered this a lot in my book, Defeat the Demons, back in 2012. So there you go. Start thinking, you know, I had a friend who got the first needle crap and said he felt like a an energy was taken over his body. And he thought he was, he was doomed. And he started screaming and kicking back. And this energy force, he said, instantly left him. So maybe this is where you need to be, communicating with the ancestors, going to sacred sites, maybe visualizing your DNA restored back to where it was before these bastards uh, attacked you. But I'm not going to say anything, but I do, you know, it's something to be aware of. No, I'm not going to frighten anybody, but uh, if you're worried about it, immediately run. You should be doing it already. You should be fighting, using your epigenetic uh, powers of will to reconstruct, maybe visualize your DNA being reconstructed in real time, visualize these other things dissolving and flowing out of your body and that kind of thing. It may happen naturally, so it's not like the end of the world. But, if, you know, remember, you do have a life raft, epigenetics. So get working on that. The, the Vedics um, believe that you can take steps to live a life so that you won't need to take another material birth, and it's called mukti and it means liberation from material existence so perhaps just a thought but maybe those who didn't won't have to come back and live another material life here and those that did will just have to come back and do it all again yeah i'm, I'm definitely coming back i've known that about that's what i want to do and um, the concept of matcha patham where you have the cycles of karma and uh, re, you know a, a, and reincarnation that's i take that very seriously and uh, I, I have every intention of getting to 111 and starting at one again and um, uh, other people if they want i I'm, I'm certainly not ready to ascend to any kind of spiritual state i want another uh, at least another couple of bites of the cherry here and uh, so yeah that's something to think about as well maybe you can have a direct path to you know there's lots of people i know it's funny how i know so many new age people who post memes about I, I don't want to come back here i don't want to be in this life again i don't want to come back to all this again you, you, should, you need to be careful about that because you could be you, you could be putting quantum suicide on yourself and uh, if i if like if i was transubstantiated i would make a serious effort to come back and try and live and live this existence again following this like as the as orthodox jews can do or, or believe in and uh, this time not to take the transubstantiation you know this is probably why these people didn't step on the titanic that they came back and lived it again so um it's up to you it, 
but don't be careful. Don't be saying things like, oh, no, I don't want to come back or I don't believe in anything after this because you may be quitting. You may be committing quantum suicide. As many of these debunkers, tragically, even though lots of them were not nice, nasty, not people who made personal attacks on anyone they didn't agree with. Well, a lot of them have made have committed quantum suicide because they were transubstantiated by the needle craft and they also didn't believe that there was anything after this. So you've got to, you've got, you know, you, you, like Thomas More sa says, you've got to care for the soul. It's a garden that you have to care for. Well, it's you. It's your essence, isn't it? It is what you are at your very core. It is you. This is a... The body's the vehicle and the soul or the spirit, whatever you want to call it, is you. Sarah, I I was talking to a friend that we were, if they were going to ever bring in mandatory needle craft, what we were going to do. And we were both, you know, he was talking about he was going to fight into the debt. It was, it was simple as that. That's what it came down to. And uh, our stupid politicians have no idea. They're so stupid. And they're so clueless. They have no idea the level of the resistance that was out there to this. That they, they would they would enter the they would enter the gates of hell. I can tell you one thing for certain: that people who pushed for the ideas of the idea of mandatory needlecraft and said things like you know let the ones who are not uh, not not uh, not needlecraft all don't let the, I'll give them operations or don't let them have a life. I wouldn't want to be where they're going after this because they may have they may have destroyed their karma with that behavior because they try to not only you know it's one thing to slew another human being but they tr attempted through needlecraft mandatory needlecraft to slew their souls and that 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 you know the goddess Kali won't tolerate that on the other side. So you know all all you smart asses out there who thought you were great saying. You know, kick their doors down and do it to them, or don't take their lives away if they don't do it. Uh, you're probably in a, you are in a much worse position than people who are coerced in the, into it by the, the monsters. Any of the coercers, if there's such a word, but they are the they are the most damned of all. The, the spiritual consequences of this, I just cannot imagine. Cannot imagine. No. It's, um, no. I can't even put it into I can't even get an image or find the words of what the consequences of this could possibly be. It must be cosmic. Yeah. I, I could understand there are people who are frightened and fearful who said that they might be okay. But there was also sadists. There was obviously you could see there were sadistic sadists out there who were loving the idea of mandatory needlecraft. They are the ones who are, you know, like you said, the spiritual consequences. You'll also find many of them also live the, the, the most debased lives. They're, they're on the Epstein's Island list and all this kind of thing, you know. And uh, they're, they're the worst kind of celebrities out there uh, that have all kinds of horrible scandals concerning children around them and everything. So uh, they're already, they've already begun their, uh, their annihilation, their, their, their cosmic annihilation. Everything, all the veils just seems to be falling away, though, more and more as, as the weeks and months go on now. Things are just falling away, like the um, the scandal we've got over at ITV, yep. things that are coming out there, um, all sorts of things that it's like the curtains just being not not just pulled back slightly, but the curtains literally being pulled off the off the curtain rail so we can all see. We're five days into the month associated with a particular type of flag and it's oh, flopped. it's flopped i don't see it's nothing like it was previous years there's boycotts going on so you know it, it, it the soul of humanity is awakened and i know that's a i don't like using that because that tends to be a kind of a christian thing you know but in terms of the the, the ones who have the eyes to see it you know the ones who taken the sword from the sheath at ragnarok to face the uh you know, to face the serpent, uh, they're, they're already doing it. They're doing it. So, you know, it's an epic battle at the end of time, but it's not the end of the world. Don't think that. It's your, it's, it's, uh, it's everything but that. 
I do want to do something to help people who are, you know, who were in, transubstantiated. I want to do, I want to help them. Uh, and I do believe that the epigenetics is the, is the way forward for that. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's important we talk about what these, these, these monsters did to us uh, because we have the justification to slay them. And they're, they're doomed anyway, but uh, I'm tremendously proud of so many people. I, I know I called the tribe and all that, and it sounds kind of schmaltzy, but I'm unbelievably proud of how many thousands of people I know that stood up and said, forget about it, shove it up your arse. And this is the hill I die on. And now you have women doing the same regarding the whole if women exist kind of thing. And uh, they're, 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 they're the warriors. They're the they're the Queen Maves and the Boudicas of the present. And uh, it's because once you start fucking with natural law, you, you're doomed. You can never defeat natural law. You can never compromise. You can push it out of the way, but that pendulum will always swing back. And uh, that, that will always swing back. So, you know, I'm surrounded by warriors uh, right now. And uh, and even the ones who, who are coerced into that thing, and um, they can be warriors. They, they, you know, they, they can, they're, now they're their chance to step up to the plate and, uh, and, and, and fight this thing inside them. Collectively, collectively, the fire in the belly has been lit, I think, the solar plexus area. The, I, suppose, the, I think the Vedics refer to it as the fire in the belly. Um, you say the soul of humanity. I say the, the fire in the belly has been lit, and I don't think you can put it out now. No, no, you can't. I mean, I remember talking to my grandparents about the War of Independence here, and they said there was a point where everyone said, okay, we're going to have to do it. Uh, you know, that's it. We're going to have to suffer through it. Uh, enough is enough. And that's how a lot of things people feel in the world at the moment, you know. Yeah, when you push a people too far and you push against natural law too greatly, uh, you can't win. It's 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 over. So the Kali Yuga is that. The Kali Yuga is uh, the, the the conversation we're having right now, the transcendental nature of this into the next the next yuga cycle is 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 through this conversation. Is through these thoughts. This, this is a form of meditation. This is this is philosophy. This is what the you know. This is this is where we are now, and uh, I think it's a very healthy thing. I don't see any negative about it. I don't think any dark about it. I just think that it's like you know, as as what's his name, Bill Hicks said. You know, it's a ride, and the ride has now hit the bumpy part, and. Uh, it's good, better to have a front a front seat row than be you know being than being a deer caught in the headlights, which unfortunately most will be. I, so, I liked what I liked what you said. You you, you said something to um, someone you bumped into in Cork. I think you said you'd rather be a uh, you'd rather be alive. More on than more a, on than a dead rationalist. I love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. That was fabulous. Yeah, I'd rather be a, a, a dead, a, a dead, stupid, moronic conspiracy, a live, stupid, moronic conspiracy theorist, and than a dead, responsible rationalist. And that's the story of the Kali Yuga. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, hold on to your four leaf clovers and get your Renfield Rain Max at the ready. And put your sunscreen in the pockets, because whether it's raining cats and dogs or the sun is shining, like that proverbial pot of gold at the end of a rainbow, our favourite Irish weatherman has got you covered. It's Thomas with the Psychic Weather. Thank you, Sarah. I should have been dressed as a leprechaun considering this that intro, and this is the last uh, one of the season. But anyway, psychic weather this week, same last two weeks, dream world. Uh, I'm getting a lot of emails from people, and I'm having them myself. The, you know, the nightmares have definitely subsided, and now we're in a world of kind of dreams, uh, very deeply mad off the scale symbolic dreams. And I've literally been having psychedelic trips the last couple of nights, 
in terms of my dream wanderings. So the, something's happened in the zeitgeist that would change this reality, that would change them away from a nightmare and into a into a very symbolic uh, dreamscape. So the psychic weather would be pay attention to those symbols, pay attention to those strange things that happen in the strange dreams. I know so in, our dreams are often mad and incomprehensible also, but if you dream of people you haven't heard of or spoken to or known in a long time, they're in that dream for a reason and try to understand why. Maybe that is the the course that we're being set upon, first with the nightmares and now this, is that we're being told that, and it could be even part of this, you know, wave function collapse, is to communicate with our dreams, uh, just analyze, think about them, try to even proactively get into them. There's things appearing in dreams. Like someone had mentioned to me today that in all the years of dreams and all the people, since it's people have had mobile phones, cell phones, cell phones and mobile phones never appear in dreams. However, some people have told me in the recent weeks they've actually started to see cell phones and mobile phones inside, smartphones inside dreams. What that means, I don't know, but it's a very interesting evolution of the dream archetypal world. So that's the psychic weather for this week and for the rest of the summer. And, you know, get into that, get into that dream zone and uh, make it make it work for you and develop your symbolic literacy and intelligence. And that's the Psychic Weather Zone, episode 23, Hocus Focus, last one of season one. And I'll see you again with hopefully a better understanding of what this dream oracle world of the last month or so has been about back at the end of July. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Interesting one. Dream work, something that um, <clears throat> I need to do a bit more work on because I tend to, um, unless they're substantial or very, very weird, I tend to just ignore them and maybe I should pay more attention to them. There's no harm in paying attention, not at all. I know uh, we come to uh, the part of the show where we dive into our 40 and libraries into our archives, into our repository of books and to share them with you and hopefully get you to read them, get you to enjoy them and get you to build your own Fortean library, your own ontological library. My choice this week is a is Gothic Dreams Cthulhu. This was given to me by my friend Linda in England a while back and I absolutely love it. It's uh, put together by an, an individual called Gordon Kerr. It combines the artwork of numerous artists going over, well, not only the Cthulhu mythos, but everything to do with Lovecraft. It's a handy little kind of almost like survival manual for the Lovecraft world, for the mythos. And it, not, it deals with facts about the characters in the books, the, 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 the entities, the gods, the the kind of beings that appear in them, stories about how Lovecraft himself got going, uh, is it weird tales, uh, everything to do with the the mythos and the universe, universe of the Lovecraftian world, all told in incredible and beautiful artwork. You see, this is the whole thing about the the Lovecraftian thing is it created a whole world of art. So. This brings you all the way through, and it also talks about the uh, the people like August Therlet who continued the Lovecraftian mythos. That was one of the wonderful things about Lovecraft being a true pagan that he was. I mean, well, he was, even said at one point when he was a kid he was that he didn't allow his mythos to stand still. He encouraged people to continue the mythos, and you know, August Therlet with books like I think the the Dark Brotherhood and the Shuttered Room continued that. And it gives you insight to all the short stories 
and little kind of synopses, and you're covered with this fantastic artwork. And uh, it's it's a must have for all Lovecraftians, but also it's a great one for people who are not in who maybe want to listen to lots of wonderful Lovecraft audio books on uh, YouTube. Many of them don't have ads, so you can listen to them in their completion. This is a good book to thumb through as you're listening to those in your headphones or whatever. I highly recommend it. it's beautiful quality print. And, um, you know, you, you can't go wrong with this. And it's a, uh, it talks about his time at Super, you know, where he got started with Weird Tales magazine. In fact, it's kind of like almost like an album in a modern typography of Weird Tales in many ways. And so it's a, uh, you know, if you if you like this stuff, you love this. If you want to learn about it, uh, it, 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 rather than reading the books and say listen to the, there's nothing wrong with listening to the audiobooks, by the way. In fact, it was listening to the audiobook of the the Dream in the Witch House. I've decided that the Dream in the Witch House is now my favorite story of Lovecraft that's replaced uh, the Shadow or Innsmouth. And so there you go. That's uh, it, it's Gothic Dreams Cthulhu uh, by Gordon Kerr. Can't recommend it enough. That that looks like a lovely book. Lovely illustrations in there. It's a lovely size too. Look at the size of it. It's like an album. But it's a bit small an LP. So it's just a handy size. It's not huge. It's not small. It's just it's it's in fact I've never seen a book in this size before. It's an unusual size. Yeah, the, the art. It's an it, the artwork. Wow, it, that's the best part. But it's it's just great. It's just great. Like I said, it's a fantastic visual um, accessory to listen to those, some of those wonderful old audio books that are on YouTube. Lovely. Somebody's come to say hello. Hello. My book this week is Spirit Power by Vernon Coleman. And I think in light of the last topic, it's a good choice. It's a handbook for rising above the current state of the world and a guidebook for those who want to rebel against authority. From a, those who want to rebel from authority having its tentacles in all aspects of their lives. And the book offers really good insight for those seeking to unlock their inner power and not be controlled by external influences. And it's full of spiritual prescriptions, or as I like to call them, little kicks up the ass, to remind you how to stand in your own power and not be swept along by the masses and how to be strong and find your inner courage and to say, I'm not interested in the current thing, sorry. And Coleman's writing style is really easy. It's just easy reading um, and it's very hard to put down, actually. And I've spent many an hour thinking to myself, just one more page, just one more chapter. And it goes into things like why you shouldn't be afraid to be a rebel and um, why, why you have more power than you think you do, how to stand up for yourself, why you should put your heart and soul into everything you do how to bamboozle bureaucrats. And he also calls out a lot of ideologies and propaganda. And it's split into three parts. And the first part of the book, he explores and explains. He explores and explains the history and background to our current rather stagnant spiritual environment. And in the second part of the book, he goes into specific reasons for our loss of freedom and personal dignity. And in the third, probably the most important part of the book, it describes how you can gain your physical, mental and spiritual freedom. And you can read it cover to cover or you can choose a prescription at random and it'll help you to remember that, that you're responsible for all aspects of yourself, not authority, not your boss, not celebrity, not anybody else. It's just you. And there's two small excerpts that I want to read. Um I'll just get them now. And the first one is called Aim to be Loved or Hated but Never Ignored. And he says, Whatever you do, you should consider it a success only if it arouses some emotion in other people. If you're making shirts, cars or apple pies, you should aim to produce a reaction. 
The customer who buys your shirt, car, or apple pie should be moved in some way. If they are a, if they are moved, then you will be successful because they will buy again and they will tell their friends to buy from you. The downside of all this, of course, is what if what you do pleases some people, but it will annoy and upset others. You cannot possibly do anything which will please everyone. Many people worry intensely if they feel there is a chance that anything they do could arouse criticism. For example, fear of ridicule or disdain is one of the main reasons why many people are apprehensive about doing anything which could attract attention. It's a fear of criticism which stops many people attempting to explore their own artistic skills. This is a fear which needs to be put into perspective. Approximately half of the so-called civilised world dislikes the works of Picasso and Beethoven. One half of the world cannot understand the pleasures of the other, wrote Jane Austen. So why should you bother to be offended if some people don't like what you do? And the other one that I just wanted to read is um, Don't Be Afraid to Be a Rebel. He says, you should not be afraid to be unconventional. The boys and girls who seem to be the high achievers at school often turn out to be life's drones. Those who were popular with their teachers and who do particularly well at school usually end up doing something dreary, like managing the local sewage works. But you must use humour in order to take the sting out of the hatred and the fury of the conventional. If you attack a conventional man for being ordinary, he will hate you because in his heart he knows that you are right. But if you laughingly apologise for your eccentricity, then he will accept you. And he just goes on, basically he's talking about NPCs, but he's, he calls them the, uh, the the conventional. He's a bit more polite about it than, than us. But it's a great book and I have this book out all the time and usually I just open it at random especially if see, things seem like they're getting a bit out of hand or a bit out of control. So as you can imagine, the book's been well thumbed over the last three years. Um, and it's a great book. It'll get you through, help get you through the Kali Yuga. Yeah, some great advice there. What year did that come out? 2000. That's had a good long while now. Yeah. Just in time for the first wave function collapse. So there you go. I mean, I used to watch Vernon Coleman when he sat in the chair. Did you watch his YouTube videos? An old man in a chair and they took did, him yeah. down. Yeah, yeah, That's I quite great. like him. Great book. Yeah, I didn't even know he had that book. I'm going I'm to get my hands on that. Okay, well, there we have it. Episode 23, we made it to the first season. And we're taking our break. And uh, again, thank you everybody for being part of this conversation and being here with us and... Uh, given us so much inspiration and support and great listening viewer numbers and lots of feedback on the book choices, the films and everything else. And, uh, you know, it's been great. I want to personally thank Sarah for this because this was actually her idea uh, to do this show. I wasn't really interested in going and doing a regular show, but she, she lit a fire under my arse and I'm glad she did. So thank you for that, Sarah. And uh, don't forget to subscribe and all that other stuff. And uh, we'll see you at the end of the summer. Yeah, and I just want to echo um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And again, we can't express enough gratitude for all the love, support, likes, shares and just general positive vibes that you've showered upon the show and our individual channels. And it, it's been great. And again, a special shout out to everyone who, par who participated in uh, last week's chat it was great seeing all of you dive into that exchanging ideas and theories and just having a good time and we do hope those connections continue to flourish and grow into fantastic friendships during our summer break when we'll be back in on the 30th of July with a new season of Hocus Focus um, in the meantime both Thomas and I will be back to posting videos and content on our respective channels and websites. And we hope that you'll continue to watch and read our work over the summer. And don't forget that there is the Hocus Focus playlist so you can catch up with missed episodes or re-watch your favourite ones. And there's also the Velocity of Now playlist, which has about 10 years of Vons in there, I think. 
And they're like choosing a tarot card. You just pick one at random and I guarantee there'll be something in it that you can relate to. Yeah, don't forget both of us will be at the Mysterious Air Conference in St. Anne's in, uh, yeah. September. September. Um, and then, yeah, a big hug and heartfelt thank you for being part of this 40 and tribe. And um, and thanks to Thomas for um, agreeing to take me on and having some faith in me into making something great. No, it's been tremendous fun. And uh, so hit us with a hit us with a uh, tarot card, Sarah. OK, the tarot of the week this week is the King of Cups. And the king is a majestic figure seated upon a grand stone throne. And his attire consists of a deep blue tunic and a regal golden cape, which symbolises his authority. And around his neck, he's got a small fish necklace, which represents his creative energy and his intuitive abilities. And in his right hand, he holds a cup, which serves as a symbol of emotions and depths of the human psyche. And in his left hand, he's got a scepter signifying his power and control over his realm. And unlike his counterparts in the other court cards, he's not fixated upon his cup. Instead, his attention seems to be focused elsewhere. And that suggests that he's already achieved a level of mastery over his emotional self, allowing him to navigate his feelings with ease and confidence. Now, the King of Cups card represents emotional mastery, intuition and compassion. And when this card appears in a reading, it suggests that you have developed a deep understanding of your emotions and have learned to navigate them with grace and wisdom. In a current situation, the King of Cups advises you to trust your intuition and rely on your emotional intelligence. You have the ability to tap into your inner wisdom and make decisions from a place of deep understanding. So trust yourself and the guidance that your emotions provide. The card also indicates that you are in a position of emotional stability and control. You have achieved a balance between your head and your heart, allowing you to approach situations. Stop it. Allowing you to approach situations with compassion and empathy. Others may selfish promise. Artists. In a current situation, the King of Cups advises you to trust your intuition and rely on your emotional intelligence. You have the ability to tap into your inner wisdom and make decisions from a place of deep understanding. Trust yourself and the guidance that you, your emotions provide. And this card indicates that you are in a position of emotional stability and control and that you've achieved a balance between your head and your heart, allowing you to approach situations with compassion and empathy. Others may seek your guidance and support due to your ability to create a harmonious and nurturing environment. In relationships, the King of Cups suggests that you are caring and understanding and your emotional depth and ability to connect with others on an intuitive level create a strong foundation for meaningful connections and you offer support, love, compassion to those around you and your presence is comforting and assuring. Professionally, the King of Cups signifies a leader who leads with empathy and diplomacy. You possess the skills to navigate emotional dynamics and nurture positive relationships within the workplace. And your ability to understand and support the emotions of others makes you a valuable asset in team settings. So generally speaking, the King of Cups reminds you to embrace your emotional intelligence and trust your intuitive guidance. 
Allow yourself to connect with your emotions and those of others as they can provide valuable insights and direction. And by approaching life's challenges with compassion and understanding, you'll navigate them successfully and create a harmonious and fulfilling existence. And on the other side of that, also, it can also mean that there could be somebody close in life that, that embodies all those aspects as well. So it might not just be talking about yourself. It could be somebody that's in your immediate circle or that is, is in your energy at the moment. Yeah, he's floating on the, in the sea, isn't he, on that card? Yes, so he, a turbulent he is, sea. He is, a, he is an island that he's, he's self-contained with himself what Carl Jung referred to as the Senex, the, the older man who has gone through the mill and has created a sense of inner security where he doesn't care what anybody thinks of him anymore. Now, I think the island represents that he won't go around giving advice like the emperor will, but he will um, give advice when asked uh, through compassion and emotions. Good card there. I like that. If, if you're a woman, it's probably someone you know. If it's a man, well, hopefully it's someone you should aspire to be when you as you age. <clears throat> okay, and before we say goodbye, special announcement. Over the last couple of months, Sarah and I have been working on a book. It's called Hocus Focus, Merging Fortiana, Hontology and High Strange. It will be out in the autumn, well, the early, late summer, hopefully. And uh, we're finishing it up now. And it's uh, it's basically what you saw on this show but a deeper dive and a, a stronger look at things. It's a very philosophical thing. We started off wondering how we would do it, and it kind of evolved by itself. It's got things to do with, you know, famous 40 and a paranormal stories, but we look at them in new ways, and we consider them in new from new angles as well as the traditional ones. And we showed us a meaning to these things in your life. We looked strongly at the things like the urban Fortiana, the concept of the deep town. Sarah writes a, writes a one chapter, takes that into a very interesting place and why certain places are the way they are. We also deal with chapters dealing with the sea, uh, dealing with the land, the, 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 the natural world. And finally, it wraps up with why this stuff is useful for you and why you need to know it. We cover everything from secret military experiments to... David Bowie's and Kurt Cobain's relationship with the paranormal and the occult and all kinds of things in between. It was been a great fun writing it actually. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm pretty sure you'll you'll absolutely love it when you're reading it. We both set out to write a kind of book that we would love, and I think we've done that. Yeah, and it's um it's been, so far it's been great fun doing it as well. I'm really, really enjoying it. And I'm looking forward to the finished article and seeing it and actually holding it in my hand. Yeah, and it'll have plenty of illustrations in it too. It'll be, a, well, I think, my brief when I wrote, when Sideris and I started the book, I said, I want one I can bring to the toilet with me, and it will be that. Good night, everybody. See you on July 30th. Have a good summer. Bye.